Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Kami Dogu podcast. I am Christopher Beljanovsky, and joining me as always is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. Toasty! So glad to be with you once again. And if you're new here, what we do is we simply share our love of Mortal Kombat, whether it be through interviews or discussions about various topics. One quick favor, please follow the podcast in the app of your choice so that you never miss an episode. And please rate and review if there's a place to do that, we'd really appreciate it. And finally, be sure to share our podcast with a friend so that they too can enjoy our content. Hello, everyone. As Chris said, it's good to be back today. 1997's movie Mortal Kombat Annihilation has always had a cult following. Lots of mixed feelings worldwide, but the ones who love it, love it. As a man who lives and breathes Mortal Kombat while also having a knack for nostalgia, MK Annihilation plays a really important part for me. I can think of a number of people who are thoroughly going to appreciate this special today. And so Kamidogu is really looking forward to having this underway. Annihilation brought forward a whole bunch of combatants uh, for the diehards to admire, including some rather gargantuan characters of different races, for example, the centaur Motaro and the Shokan Shiva. Well, my friends, today we are overjoyed to be accompanied by the personal protector of Queen Sindel, Shiva herself, portrayed by actress Marjean Holden. Marjean is an outstanding actress and stuntswoman who has been involved in some notable names such as Beastmaster, Babylon 5, Tales from the Crypt, and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. We are happy to have her here, and with that said and done, let's switch over to today's interview. And here we are, everyone, joined with Marjean Holden, who played the four-armed Shiva herself. Look at that. She's still got all these <laughs> movements going on. Oh, ah, still in the spirit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. Something like that. It never, it never leaves you, right? Right, Marjean? It actually doesn't. You know, and the amount of people are like, how many arms did you have? Like six? I'm like, four. There were only four. <laughs> Not that hard to distinguish. There were four. That's it. <laughs> uh, when it comes to growing up, uh, did you always want to be an actress? Uh, when did this mission really begin for you? I did, actually, from oh. grade four. I wanted to be an actress. I had produced, starred, directed my first production in grade four. It was a production oh. of The Three Little Pigs. Oh. Um, at that time, Disney had put out like all of their sort of like fairy tales, whatever stories on, I know, vinyl, going back a little bit. <laughs> um, and they had this whole vinyl of the three little pigs, this whole big elaborate story and beyond what the normal three little pig story is right so i thought well what a great thing let's just play like let's lip sync to the album and we'll do this production you know and i got all my friends to be in the three little pigs and i was the wolf and you know so that was my first experience really with the whole production aspect and i came home and i told my mom i said i'm gonna be an actress and she was like yeah that's <laughs> nice that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, sure enough. Okay. And, you know, and then when I got into college there, when I was at college, I, there wasn't really a good um, sort of fine arts major. So I majored in producing and directing television. Didn't finish mm -hmm. college because I started working in the industry and thought, what do I need a degree for to do the thing I actually want to do when I'm doing the thing I wanted to do? So I just started working. 1985, I started working in film production. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So jumping to MK Annihilation, tell us about your journey of receiving the role of Shiva. Was it a long auditioning process? For me, it was. 
seven callbacks. Oh, you know, yeah. Seven. It was one wow. of those things where it was, okay, can you handle the dialogue? Can you handle the, phys handle the physicality? And I literally had the call, I had the first call, then a callback, then another callback for producers. And then they just kept calling me back in and every single callback was something kind of different than the uh -huh. previous one. But a lot of them were just the physicality of it. And I had already been training martial arts. So for me, it wasn't a problem. They had all these huge elaborate plans for Shiva because you know, in the game, she's got all these crazy moves, right? Yes. So they wanted to make sure that I could move and do the moves. And finally, <clears throat> they made the call and my agent called me and they're like, she was like, you got it. And I was like, thank God. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, it was literally the longest, most tedious, most nerve wracking um, process for me of getting a job. Wow. Yeah. Wow. In your entire career, eh? That was the longest? That was the longest one. Yeah. Most of them wow. were, you know, first call, callback, job. First call, mm. callback, maybe second callback, job. But yeah, this was a different kind of whole different thing. <laughs> All different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what type of, of martial arts were you studying at, uh, at that time? Uh, did you have uh, a black belt in anything or, or what did you uh, take part in? No, I was training Kung Fu and the okay. style was one hop Kundo. It was a cross oh. between Northern and Southern styles, um, Kajakembo and a combination of, uh, so I, that's what I was training. That was made famous by, um, Mark Dacascos's dad, Al Dacascos. Oh. So yeah, so that's, you know, and I, you know, dated Mark for four years and I grew up with him kind of in the acting industry and that's what I trained and then started training with one of his dad's black belts and trained with him, my Sifu, Sifu Earl White for 10 years, but didn't really, my goal was never like, oh, I have to be a black belt. I have to be this, I have to be that. It was just, I need to train and I'm going to train so that I'm ready to do, um, what I need to do a for my acting roles and B I started doing stunts in 92. So when I started doing stunts, I was like, Oh, Hey, this is kind of valuable. Let me keep, you know, doing fights. Cause I would just get cast, you know, to do stunt fights or whatever. And I'm like, cool. Very nice. Yeah. In terms of Shiva herself, did you happen to do any research into a character at all before taking on the role? You know what? I played the game and found out as much as I could through the game. And then it was just kind of watching the first movie to see what they did with Goro and which was a whole totally different thing, right? Because it was... <laughs> 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 I was like, we're not going that route, are we? Because, <laughs> and I mean, and they wanted the female Shokan to look different than Goro, right? So yeah. they wanted her to be more human looking. And mm -hmm. so it was like, hey, well, we'll just, you know, build you up with prosthetics. We'll do that whole route. And I was like, I thought, okay, cool. That's, that's cool with me. And do more so makeup than the CGI and all of that. Ah. So, but you know, I played the game. That was about it. <laughs> I played the game. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, considering how much martial arts was needed in order to receive the role, um, you know, you look at it now and it is rather strange uh, considering Shiva doesn't really get physical that much in the movie. However, it's clearly written in the shooting script and novelization of the film that Shiva was originally supposed to have a massive battle between Raiden and Liu Kang at the same location where Sindel fights Jax in the movie via the Adenian ruins. Tell us the exact specifics on why they decided to cut it out uh, and how you felt about that at the time. Did you ask Larry Kazanoff that? <laughs> he was the <laughs> he was a producer. Um, we should have. <laughs> yeah, that's a it's a great 
question for producers because I wasn't really like I, you know, actors always, you know, we don't really have a lot of control unless you're like the A-list actor and you're the producer and the executive producer and sure. wearing multiple hats. Right. But the, it was really super disappointing because I showed up in London to start shooting and they were like, Oh, and by the way, we cut your fight. And I was like, wait, what? Like, that's kind of all she was here to do is fight. <laughs> so yeah. what exactly is she supposed to do now? And why? And all I got was, you know, it was just too expensive. It was too expensive oh, to fight. Okay. So it Good. was that because of this that fight. Yeah, because it was that fight and another one with um, Reptile in the temple. So what? To, to oh, at the same time. At the same time. So to reproduce and to produce Shiva with you know all of the prosthetics and the and the cgi and a reptile with all the cgi and everything that was going to go into it they were just like yeah it's like a million dollar sequence so we can't we're not doing it and oh, it was like, hmm. Ugh. and i i literally God. said to them then cut her out of the movie and they were like oh you said that yeah i did and i they said no we're not going to do that and i said you really need to because people are going to be pissed. They're not mm -hmm. going to enjoy the fact that Shiva doesn't fight when she was one of the most popular characters in the video game. Right? Yes. So they were like, no, 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 no. We, we can't do that. And I was like, well, it's really going to be kind of ridiculous because she doesn't do anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> She didn't do anything. And then she dies. How? In like two seconds. And then she just get teleported yeah. into some other portal and on some other realm. You know? Maybe. 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 I always thought yeah. that. I was like, well, we don't know if she really died. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we never like, actually, actually seen the cage squish her completely. I know, right? You know? Sort of like the Wicked Witch of the West. It's like, you know she's dead because <laughs> the house fell on top of her. Because her feet curled <laughs> Right, but she, but she was just gone. She's just gone. Yeah. Uh, so just to clarify with audiences, you uh, didn't practice any type of choreography or or anything behind the scenes to get this uh, fight in motion. You did absolutely nothing. We did not do any of the fight choreography. That was meant okay. to happen when I arrived in London to, to do all my final fittings and everything because that was the first sequence that we were going to shoot for Sheba. Oh. And I didn't okay. know until I got there, yeah, we're not going to do that. I mean, I had been training and I was ready, but once we got there, um, you know, it was like, mm, it's not going to happen. Oh, so, it's a, yeah. It's a real shame. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And for it to be your first, um, you know, first thing to film, I'm, sh I'm sure yeah. it's pretty off-putting for them to just go, oh, well, that's out the window, you know? Yeah, it was like, so what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> was, you know, I'm not complaining by any means because London for a month and only doing fittings and, you know, and meetings and fittings for a month was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> You know, I saw more West End shows and it was, it was great. <laughs> but I was like, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, as an actor, you want to be, you want to be working, exactly. you want to be on screen, you want to be doing, you know, and contributing, you know, to the project that you've been hired to contribute to, you know, with your talent. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So besides that um, scene that was scrapped, um, can you recall filming anything else that, ultimately didn't make it into the film? Um, no, everything else, everything else was there because okay. that, because that was the most major, you know, major piece. And because, you know, we didn't have that. Everything else stayed in. Yeah. Everything else stayed mm. in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how long exactly did it take to get the correct prosthetics and makeup applied? Ooh, well, let's see. I think from start to finish was probably 
three months because the first the first time I showed up at special effects to do the mold, <clears throat> they yeah. have to do a body cast, a complete like full on body cast, right? Because they were making arms and they wanted to make legs, you know, prosthetic legs and all that stuff. Well, the first time they put me in the cast, like they had me covered from like here down to my waist and mm -hmm. front and back. And as soon as the mold starts to harden, like there's no, there's no more expansion in normal body functions like breathing. So as soon as I couldn't expand to catch a full breath, I yeah. started getting lightheaded and I was like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to pass out guys. And they were like, wait, what? And I was like, uh-huh. And I felt the walls just closing in. It was just like, <laughs> this was the weirdest feeling ever. It was like, and, and it was like that some sound effect came in, had to come in too. Right. It was like, and everything just closed in from the sides. And, uh, and all I heard before I went out was catch her. So she doesn't fall. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I woke up and they were like, Oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, nah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Didn't know I was claustrophobic for real. No, no idea. So they That's ended scary. up. Yeah, it was kind of scary. But they were like, did you eat breakfast today? You know, the body, the way in which it functions is it has to have some fuel to cool it down. And I was like, yeah, I ate. Like, <laughs> you know, I was in this small enclosed room with like a cast from here to here and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't catch a breath. So what they ended up doing was they sent me, um, after that, they sent me, I think like maybe two, two to three weeks later to Manchester, England to the special effects house. Pigs might mm. fly and had Gary and his crew do my whole body, my whole body cast. And they had a big shop and, you know, they could keep fans going to, to keep me cool. And they sort of did it. They did it a little differently. They did it. They really chunked it down and did it in pieces. So like they did my head, they did my head, you know, at one time, you know, I think I posted, I posted on Instagram story, like behind the scenes, Mortal Kombat. Everybody thinks life is so glamorous for actors. Here I am getting my body cast for Shiva. And it's like, I'm in my bathrobe and I've got, you know, crap all over my face <laughs> you know i've got my head cast on and two straws sticking out of my nose so i can breathe you know and it's like just everywhere and i'm like the glamorous life yeah living that good life <laughs> <laughs> wow that's really cool I, i'll have to check that out on your instagram right instagram? yeah yeah that's really cool um <laughs> so how much of of shiva uh was purely relied on CGI. Uh, is there any particular sequences that come to mind where you can confirm it was just strictly CGI? Um, yes. You know, when they all drop into the, into the, the first time you see all of the, like Sindel and you see, um, rain, you see, uh, Shiva, you see Matoro. When all of us drop into that first battle scene, and yep. that was CGI. You can tell because there's any time there's movement in the arms, CGI. But it's okay. like there are other times where they're not moving. And those were practical. Ah, uh, okay, so, so more or less the that. arms sort of just hung there. Yeah, they were they made a practical set for like still shots. And then when they went to do the other sequencing, we did, um, we did green screen and we all did, we did tracking. So I had tracking balls so that they could match my hand motions. And then they just popped that in for all of those scenes where, you know, it's like, kind of looks like this weird, you know, there's this weird sort of uh, on top of the temple. 
and and that was CGI. But a lot of the the stuff practical. I had a harness under my costume, and I'd have these these stiff arms, and it'd just be you know kind of walking around set. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. Oh, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> whoops. Uh, say, did you keep anything from the set? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't keep anything. I was like, yeah, I don't want that costume. Not even. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nothing was a pain in the ass to get into every day. So I was like, uh-uh, no thanks. <laughs> don't want to say that again. <laughs> don't want to say that again. No thanks. <laughs> You know, and it wasn't a lot there anyways, so, you know, <laughs> I was like, you can have your little piece of, you know, leather back. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe it's been confirmed that it was you that voiced Sheba throughout the movie, although they obviously yeah. probably modified your voice slightly. Um, in terms of the sound, did you base it off her um, Mortal Kombat 3 voice because it was quite deep no No. um we had used my voice and then they laid over you know they did you know they worked their magic in audio in post-production but it was all me and yeah it was all me but modified sure yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean my voice can get deep but not that deep (laughs) i was like (laughs) yeah that's stretching it was pushing it, but yeah, they, um, you know, work their magic, their magic. Uh, what are some of the fondest memories you have working on set? Uh, are there any actors in particular that you really bonded with? You know what? Mortal Kombat was one of those movies where we all bonded. It was mm. so much fun because we all spent so much time together and whether it was you know we were in london together we were in thailand together and it was months and months right so it was the whole pre-production process where we all kind of got to meet each other and then work together and we just you know robin really drove the whole kind of team aspect as well because of his background, you know, the Chinese like do so much together and his stunt yeah. team and his whole stunt crew that was working on it, like they ate together, you know, they work together, they eat together, you you are housed together, you just work together. And Robin would have us all go to dinners together and we would, you know, when we were in Thailand, we stayed in a hotel that had a bowling alley in it. Really? And so, yeah. <laughs> and so we had one day off of work, which was Sunday, because we were on six day shoots. So we'd get off work on that Saturday and we're like, okay, that's it. We're going bowling. And Red and Darren McBee. Brian. And well, and Brian, they would all be down in the bowling alley and just having like, you know, bowl off tournaments. And it was such a blast because it's like when you go to a hotel and you have a bowling alley, like in the hotel. Yeah. Right. So, and then if, if, you know, and then we'd be like, okay, we're going to Bangkok, everybody. And we would just all pile into a van as soon as we were done working and we'd go and we'd spend the night in Thailand and like Musetta and Sandra and I were like, okay, we're going to get up in the morning at like six o'clock in the morning and we're going to go to the temples and we're going to go see the monks. And we just, I mean, we really just had the best time. And that's why most of us are still in connection with each other. Whoa, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. So it's like, you know, it was just one of those, and it doesn't happen like that all the time, but I think because really it's an ensemble cast. I mean, you look at it and it's like, the good, it's the good guys and the bad guys, you know, the crew of the good guys are over here and they're constantly working together. And here's the bad guys over here and we're constantly working together. So, you know, you just have this camaraderie on set and it just carried over, you know, we're all in a foreign country and together 
So it's like, hey, let's go do something, right? Let's go explore. <laughs> Super very, cool. Very, very cool. Um, at the end of the day, from everything you filmed, what would you say is maybe the scene that you were most uh, happy with in the film uh, that you were involved with? Um, I'd have to say, God, because it all got, it was like such small little bits. Um, but the scene in the, in that round, in the round table room where, um, you know, Brian Thompson's character is like, you know, saying, oh, well, this is who we, what we need to do and blah, blah, blah. And it's sort of that spat between Shiva and Matoro where it's like, <laughs> nah, this is my job right? You've already messed it up. <laughs> so that scene, that scene was probably, it's my favorite one in the whole thing. I thought that was a great right. scene. Um, yeah. Among set, were there any like really funny bloopers or any times that just made you guys bust out in laughter? Oh my God. I can't rem I can't remember on some of my other movies. I remember, but on Mortal <laughs> Kombat, I don't. It is going back a few years. Yeah. A few years. Hey, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. That's you know, all right. Really? <clears throat> Could we have done this, you know, so that my memory, like, it's like, I don't know. I don't remember. She <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did have a blast. I mean, we all had, God, I'm just trying to think if there was any. Not that I um, recall. Who, who would you say was the funniest person uh, amongst the cast? The amongst person who made the you laugh cast the most? Or, or like amongst all of us? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So between cast and stunt crew, Mark okay. Casso, hands down, Mark Casso. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That guy. So funny. So mm. funny. Had us like kept us in stitches. Oh, nice. That always yeah. makes the time working fun. Yeah. He was so funny. I mean, cause you know, here we are, we're in Thailand, right? A bunch of Americans in Thailand. If you don't eat spicy food, like <laughs> it's, you know, you're kind of limited. And <laughs> every morning, like I would see Mark and I'm like, what are you eating? He's like, I don't know. And he'd be just like <laughs> eating and sweating and, you know, and I'm like, dude. And he was like, hey, if they're eating it and they're not getting sick, I'm going to eat it so I don't get sick. <laughs> and it was so spicy and so hot. And he's just like, you know, the, you know, the sweat is pouring and the nose is running. And I was like, nah, just give me some rice. <laughs> So out of all the scenes that you did film, what would you say was the most difficult? Hmm. What's the most difficult? And was it perhaps the scene where you were sort of physical with Mataro or? Um, God, I can't really say that was that they were super difficult or strenuous or anything because the, because the fight all the fight stuff got taken out um i mean were there any that were a little awkward maybe with the arms just trying to move around or you know i mean of course that was always kind of awkward but i tell you when i when i had to jump up on that table and the the cage kind of comes down that was just like so awkward to me that was literally so awkward because i had to um I think I, I used a mini tramp because they wanted that because, you know, they wanted like the Shiva stomp. And the only way to get the Shiva stomp is you have to get some sort of leverage and some sort of air. So right. I think we did. Yeah, we used like a mini tramp to launch me onto so that I could could get into the right stomp position and then it's like, oh, stomp, oh, die, eh, you know, here comes the cage, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so that one was always kind of awkward. 
Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Um, now, we had Brian Thompson on the show previously. Mm-hmm. He had described uh, the scenes inside Shao Kahn's palace as incredibly difficult. He stated this uh, because apparently the heat within the warehouse where you were filming was so ridiculously intense that it would even melt the foam statues and he would continuously get ill on set. Was this something that you struggled with greatly as well while working on the film? Not as badly um, because he was, he was in there a lot more than us. Right. So because it was his temple, so he was in there a lot, but it was so hot. I mean, it really was. But then here I am in like this little, little to nothing <laughs> costume. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, for one, really totally love the tropics. So it doesn't really, um, that really doesn't get me as much as cold does. Uh, so yeah. for me, I was like, I mean, the biggest drama was, you know, here we are. It's like, you know, a hundred degrees and 90% humidity and the makeup, you know, all down the side of my face, they had paint, you know, painted all the tattoo all down the side of my face and all down my neck. So not sweating it off. That was a thing. Right. Mm. So they they had to constantly like the fan on the face, you know, to not, you know, to not run. (laughs) But yeah, it was hot in there. It was hot. Yeah. Wow. Um. Uh, other than this, do you recall any other additional struggles whatsoever that the cast and crew seem to continuously have while just on the set in general? I don't. I mean, one of the things we did kind of struggle with is, you know, in Thailand, we're shooting in temples right Mm -hmm. so sacred ground and there are certain things you can and can't do on sacred ground so because we are on sacred ground like there's no open fire so they couldn't put any of those you know those little sterno packs to heat the food so the food would get to set if we weren't ready to eat you're not having hot food it's just the way it is so Mm. More often than not, it was like, oh, hey, we got pasta today. It's cold because they can't keep it warm. They couldn't, you know, they can't keep it warm. And then, you know, we're on sacred ground. So they're not too keen on the film industry being on sacred ground in the first place. And it was really interesting to see that dynamic of having to work around that. Absolutely. You know, more of a more of an issue for the producers, of course, because they had to deal with it every single day. But then for us, but when we were shooting, it was like we got to do this and we got to get it done because we got a limited amount of time that we can actually be on the grounds. So let's go and getting there to be. You know, I had three hours of makeup every day, so it was four thirty, four four thirty in the morning get into makeup so that you're ready to go by seven, seven thirty. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm of the understanding that your experience in Thailand was pretty mixed. Um, what were some of the things that you really enjoyed and some that you didn't so much? Let's see. Some of the things I really enjoyed, I loved, I mean, of course being, being there and working was awesome. Um, not <laughs> eating spicy, Spicy food, not so great. <laughs> <laughs> not so great because, you know, when you say, is it spicy? And they say, no, 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 not spicy. No, no, it's okay. Very different palates, I think. Very different. <laughs> yeah. Very different, you know? Yeah. And um, exploring because I was only on, you know, I think I was in Thailand for almost two months for almost two months, but I only worked two weeks out of the two months. So I had a lot of time to really kind of explore, look around, go to the temples, go to the, you know, to all of the sacred sites and just be there. And that was really cool for me. Um, 
the downside of that, everybody else is working. <laughs> you know, so I was like, oh, are you working tomorrow? Yes, I'm actually working. Oh, oh dang. Because I was thinking, you know, I'll just run up to Chiang Mai for the weekend. And, uh, you know, since I'm not working and go explore up there. So I ended up going up to Chiang Mai by myself and okay. just hiring, hiring a guide and went up there, had somebody drive me around for two days and went to the night markets and the temples up there and out to the hill tribes out and saw, you know, some of the hill tribes out there. And that was nice. really cool. Yeah. So it was really such a great experience, such a great experience. Mm -hmm. And then come back and are you guys working? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's everybody else is working and here's Sheba like <laughs> just kind of waiting around but uh, what what were some of the early discussions uh, in regards to uh, the general concept of Shiva's character and how she would appear on screen was there anything specific uh, they were debating bringing forward that they had decided against in the end uh, uh, was she ever slated to look a little different? Because I believe you've elaborated before that the legs were, uh, supposed to look incredibly, um, yeah, like bulky. Muscular. Yes. Yeah. Very bulky. So they did do, um, a mold of my legs and then they sculpted like muscular legs for me. But then when they put them mm. on, because they didn't do it for the rest of my body, the leg, it just looked so weird. And they were like, Ew, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't even look good. Like, we like that they look <laughs> muscular, but it's, now it's so out of proportion that we can't, yeah, we can't use them. And we tried a few different, they tried a few different times. They tried, okay, we'll make them like this. And then they, they you know, the real super muscular. And then they made them a little smaller and they still looked weird. So they were like, mm, we're not going to use those. We're just going to go with your legs. And I was like, oh, dang. So now I got to keep in shape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Extra squats for breakfast. Extra yeah. squats. Yeah. <laughs> Big time extra squats for breakfast. Yes. <laughs> you know, it was just like, mm, God. Uh, was the was the costume always going to be uh, uh, what they had in the film? Did they have any other concepts drawn up of uh, what attire she might wear? Nope, that was it. That one okay. costume, that was it. They were like, this is what she wears in the video game. And it wasn't like, oh, maybe she'll wear something different in another video game in the future. But nope, they're like, this is what <laughs> she's wearing. That's it. This is what we got. We got the red, red teddy. That was it. <laughs> and I'm sure I would have been cheap to make. I mean, there's not much there, so. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. it had to be fitted and it was made out of like, I think it was made out of pleather or something like that. It was, or um, latex something. Yeah. So it was not forgiving at all. There was no <laughs> give to it. It was just like, oh. And I'm sure I didn't help with the sweat and everything wearing that too. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't yeah. like, oh, we can just launder it. It's like, I have this yeah. <laughs> thing. Like, I get these roles where they're like, oh, you're going to have such a specialty costume and you're going to sweat a lot, but we can't wash it. <laughs> Gross. Dang. I know it's all my sweat, but ew. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, clearly the, the role as Shiva was, was extremely memorable. Um, how has it affected your professional career to date? And... Do you still get anybody recognizing you day to day on the street, perhaps? And if so, do you have any stories of any strange fan encounters? You know, I don't so much get it anymore. I used to get, I mean, when, when Annihilation was super relevant and I was more active acting, um, now people don't even, they won't even, they don't even recognize me. You know, it's like I led personal growth seminars for years and I started teaching overseas and started teaching in like Singapore and Taiwan and Malaysia and people had no idea because I never told anyone. I was just like, here I am. I'm showing up. I'm a trainer. I teach, you know, I'm leading this personal growth 
workshop. And that's my gig, right? So I didn't really talk a whole lot about, you know, oh, I'm from an acting background, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But then some of my students in one of my classes was like, she kind of looks familiar. <laughs> like, where, where do I know her from? And as soon as kind of one or two figured it out, then it was just like, oh, she's Shiva from Mortal Kombat, you know, and all these, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of young guys were having these fanboy moments. And, you know, now it's just kind of this, this, like, people will recognize me a little bit, they'll hear my voice, and they'll go, hmm, your voice sounds really familiar. And... God, I've seen you before, but I don't know where, right? They don't put two and two together. And mm -hmm. even when I lived in LA and was constantly acting, people would see me and go, you know, you kind of look familiar. You kind of look like that girl that's on, you know, whatever it was, such and such and such and such. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Aha, no, it's not. Okay, not me. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> standing right in front of you because it's, it's this bizarre because the brain goes oh no that you wouldn't possibly be like in my store when I'm there or that person on the screen's not really a real person it's a character but there's a person that plays the character you know and it's like it's very very weird very weird you know yeah. and then I do some obscure weird commercial and they'd run it all the time, you know, so I, like I did a, did a feminine product commercial. They ran it all the time during basketball games, professional basket dur during the oh. Lakers and the Clippers games. And I'm like, why? And guys <laughs> used to come up all the time and go, oh my God, you're the girl from that one commercial. And I'm like, yep, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Glad to know you're paying attention to the commercials during the game. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, now, I mean, it would be nice to, to have people recognize me, you know, every now and again. <laughs> but it's like, well, irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you happen to be on set when they filmed the original ending for the film before it was canceled last minute it involved uh Rainer Schoni I pronounced my uh excuse my pronunciation as oh, Shinnok Reiner Schoen? and a Rainer Schoen? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh-oh. Sorry. Who that? <laughs> it's all Who good. Did? Don't worry. I had to mute Who I had to it? mute mine once too. I was like, oh my God, can we put that on like, do not disturb? <laughs> Amateur? Jeez. We're going to film the show here. <laughs> Decline. All right. From the top. From the top. From the top. So, so Reiner Schoen, right? <laughs> Original scene. Yes, Reiner Schoen. Did you happen to be on set when they filmed the original ending uh, for the film? Uh, apparently a random citizen from the local area uh, was just kind of slapped in to portray Quan Chi. Uh, the scene consisted of them discussing in the nether realm uh, regarding uh, their next steps for their evil plan. Did you see any of this uh, occur? Mm, I don't. God, I don't recall that. I mean, I remember being on set when they filmed part of it because I was still there. Um, uh -huh. But I don't remember the random citizen. Yeah. Don't remember that part. Yeah, he didn't know a word of English and they just grabbed him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, you, come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> now, I understand that you have ambitions to produce, direct, and inspire people um, through much of your work. Um, how deep have you uh, progressed in that, like down this path? So, I've only, like, I directed a short film a couple of years ago, but I've been working on a couple of 
projects in the last year. One's kind of a throwback to the eighties, you know, the bad B movies oh. of the eighties, like action movies. Um, and that's actually working in, in collaboration with Darren McBee. It's his project. Oh. And when he presented it to me and my, my ex-husband then, well, he's ex-husband now, then, um, I was like, wow, I, I don't even like this script. And because it was literally an eighties, really bad eighties movie still. And I thought, mm, I can't do, you know how they used to always make all the, the low budget B action movies were always in a strip club and you know, they're <laughs> all and all of that stuff. I was like, yeah, first of all, if I'm going to be involved in this and I'm going to direct it or produce and direct it, we're not doing the whole strip club thing. That's just way overrated, yeah. outdated, overplayed. And um, from an actor's perspective, I was like, I'm not going to put an actress through that. So let's think of something else. So we ended up reworking the script to have it set in more of a roadhouse type of situation so that it's more like the truck stop roadhouse country coyote ugly type of scene okay. and that really works well so i've got that that going on that one's kind of slow going um and then just recently took on another project with one of my longtime friends from the Beastmaster series, he was the main stunt double on that. He's a very talented writer, and he has a project that he told me about about 15 months ago. And he says, oh, I've got this great script, you know, and I've written the pilot. And all he gave me at that time was a title. And I was like, oh, that's a really good title. <clears throat> So three months ago, <clears throat> I said to him, I said, so, hey, what's happening with um, Satan's Atlantis? And he was like, how do you know about that? And I was like, because you told me about it a year ago. And he was like, <laughs> I did. Like he had totally forgotten that he had told me about it. And I was like, yeah, you told me about it. I didn't tell anyone about it. And I was like, dude, you told me about it. And it's a year <laughs> later. And he's like, oh, my God, I haven't even like thought about it and since he picked it back up we've you know the last three months we've been working on it really hard and he's been rewriting and writing and we've been coming up with new concepts for it and we're working on that and we're about to do a read through in a couple of weeks on that and that's exciting so it's really exciting like it's really exciting because satan's atlantis is it's gone and it's it's more from feature film to series and back and forth and back and forth but there's enough material because it's all it's the journey of satan's spirit guides who are commissioned to keep him in hell so that he doesn't wreak havoc on the world more than he already is but he escapes so it's their journey of trying to get him back into hell and them following their own journeys of how they became Satan's spirit guides in the, in the first place. Like what did they do to land them the gig of being Satan's spirit guides? So it's their whole journey. And it's, and it's quite, you know, funny because you've got one of the characters who, who is like the ultimate spiritual, like, she's like, my connection to God is the greatest and it's the most pure and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. And there's another one who's like, yeah, I don't believe the big guy at all. <laughs> right. And they all have these certain, certain different powers, but then when they get bounced into the third dimension, they're like, wait, what is happening here? Why are we on earth again? And oh my God, now we have to find him again before he destroys humanity again <laughs> right again well so, again that's yeah. something so it's a <laughs> yes. really funny yeah it's a really funny really funny script and you know there's serious tones about it and then there's the humor about it and 
you know, the writer, he's Aussie. So he's got that Aussie sense of humor in there. It's, it's pretty. <laughs> 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 but that's what's happening at the moment. Satan's Atlantis. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, what's amazing to me is how it seems consistently Mortal Kombat always comes full circle. Um, you've mentioned previously that you, uh, met and became close with Mark Dacascos, um, who actually happened to play the Shell and Monk Kung Lao many years later in MK Legacy. Um, so I just want to start off by asking, did you see the Legacy shorts and uh, did you get a kick out of his... Uh... <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> this is terrible. This is terrible because like, like, look, it's like all of these guys, like I've known them forever, like Michael Jai White. I've known him forever. Yeah. Did I watch any of that stuff with, you know, with him when he was playing Jax? I'm like, eh, I think I caught maybe 30 minutes of it. And I'm like, but Mortal Kombat is just like, it's the universe that will never die. It's, yes. it's, it, it's amazing. Like, it is so amazing to me that it has lasted, you know, the test of time. I mean, we're going on 30 years now. Yeah, 30 years. 30 yeah. years. You know, so it's kind of cool to be part of a franchise, you know, that's not Marvel. It's not DC. You know, it's not one of those that, like, you know, I grew up on Batman and Robin when I was a kid. That was, you know, 50 years ago. So sure. I'm like, um, Mortal Kombat. It's its own universe. It's its own thing. And it's 30 years later. It's just, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. It's Mm -hmm. phenomenal. Uh, So you said um, Mark sort of influenced you in the realm of martial arts. You even ended up doing a few film projects together, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, What are some great moments you've had with Mark and uh, just a few things you've learned along the way? Oh, the, the, the best moment was Mark and I, um, played, like, okay, so we dated and then we broke up. And then a few years later, I became friends with, um, a stunt coordinator, Shane Dixon, who has since passed. He passed in 99. He was the stunt coordinator on Tales from the Crypt. And there was an episode where they needed <laughs> two women to play the wives of two martial artists and Mark and Stoney Jackson were the husbands that were supposed to be in this big cage fight. Only they needed wives. So Debbie Dunning plays Stoney Jackson's wife and I play Mark's wife. And when my friend Shane came to me, he goes, Oh my God, I have the best role for you. And I really, really want you to do this, this role. He goes, but, He's like, oh, I know you guys, you know, you're not dating anymore or anything, but Mark, they've already cast Mark. And is it going to be weird if you guys work (laughs) together? And because of the dynamic of the relationship, like she was super controlling and was like, you're doing this. (laughs) You know, it worked out so well. It was so funny. We had the best time. (laughs) Oh my God. We had so much fun. And then of course, in the end of the episode, it's like, the big fight in the pit that was supposed to be the two guys ends up, they set us up, the two women, to be in the pit fighting to the death. Because <laughs> they, and they were like, ooh, uh-huh. you know. So that was the big joke. But yeah, had such a great time. Such a great time. We're still good friends. Good, nice. good. Yeah. Glad to hear that. So, Marjean. We are now going to jump to the final segment of the show, and it is called Final Round. So what we're going to do in this final round, (laughs) (laughs) what we're going to do in this final round is just ask you a few quick questions, try to get to know you a little more. So the first question being a nice and easy one. What's your favorite color? Green. Green. I like it. Tell us about your very first date. Ooh, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> it's the stories that mean everything. You know what? If it's that, if you really don't want to, no, but. Uh, pass. Uh, I'm going to take pass. Pass <laughs> It'll be too much cringe. It'll be too much cringe. Um, do you. Do you have any secret talents or just tell us something most people don't know about you? 
something most people don't know about me. I love to bake. Like if your oh. birthday's coming up and we're in the in the near vicinity, I'm definitely baking you a birthday cake. Oh. Yeah. No I way. love to Very bake. Nice. Love to bake. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um yeah, yeah maybe I mean, one I day. I'll... Good, but I do love to bake. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm told that, you know, when I bake stuff, it, it's received really well. Yeah. Good. Good. Nice. Nice. Uh, uh, do you um, t tell us one of the funniest uh, or most embarrassing moments in your life or just something that you will never forget as long as you live? Oh, funny, embarrassing or one I'll never forget. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I was a senior in high school and I grew up in Colorado. And we used to go watch, um, like, they, they had professional hockey teams that used to come to our arena in our little small town. And I was at a hockey game with my girlfriend. And the way in which you got up to the stands is you, you climbed up the stairs and then went around the top of the ice arena. And then you'd have to climb down into the stands on the other side. I was standing up, and the, the scoreboards are on each end. So I was standing up by that scoreboard and one of the players like slaps a, you know, slaps the puck, you know, to, to practice, you know, trying to make a goal. The goalie deflects it and it comes straight at me. And it was like slow motion uh. and my girlfriend's going, oh my God. And she's literally watching this puck and I'm watching it and there's nothing I can do because I'm like just totally paralyzed, right? With like the slow motion and it's coming right at me and hits me right here in the eye. Oof. Just oh. boom, right in the eye and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> what just happened? But it was like I could. It, it happened so fast, but in slow motion that I just I couldn't even move. Most memorable thing ever, ever. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, and it just it like it nicked right here, and it like broke the skin. So I had a little bit of a split right here, and uh, yeah, I wasn't blush gush, gushing blood or anything. So I was like, eh, I have a oh, headache for a little bit. Let's go watch the game. <laughs> very Jeez. very lucky <laughs> very lucky very yeah. lucky that it wasn't you know like slightly over i would have mm. lost my eye wow now clearly you're not a fan of spicy but what is your favorite food <laughs> oh my god let's see what's my favorite food <sighs> i i really enjoy a good steak Mm, it's very like, nice. Probably like my favorite. But when in Australia, and if I'm in Sydney, going to the fish market and getting fresh <laughs> sushi, oh my God. <laughs> like no other in the world. Oh my God. Very it's nice. like, give me, give me that whole half a salmon. <laughs> 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 um, what is the most daring thing you've ever done? Ooh, the most daring thing I've ever done. Let's see. I one of the stunt jobs that I had um was on speed two. And I think I was actually I was actually I think I was actually filming Mortal Kombat at the time. And I had had like a month off or something and they were like, Hey, you know, come do stunts on, you know, the stunt coordinator's like, Hey, come do stunts on, on speed two. And I was like, okay. And then weather delays and everything like that. It was like, um, I gotta go back to work. Like I gotta go back to like my co-starring role now. And he was like, great. Well then we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to kill you. And in one of the scenes, there was a, you know, where they're on the ship, there's one of this, those, you know, pod boat pods you know life lifeboats and they drop it over the edge and into the water so he's like well because you can't stay and be in all the stuff we're just gonna have to throw you over you're gonna have to fall overboard so me and one other guy i was like "Ooh, first of all i'm not really a high faller and second ooh, it's water i'm like eesh. 
okay, you know, and it was about, mm, I guess it was about 25, 30 feet. And they were like, okay, and action. And it's like, he goes over, then I go over. And I was just like, I can't even believe I'm getting ready to do this. Like, <laughs> this is craziness. Like, yeah. You're just going to fall off the side of the boat. And it's literally like that fast <laughs> of in the, in the, in the movie. It's that fast when you see it. But if you stop it, you can see me like falling over in, in midair. And it was, they're like, Oh yeah, we got to do it again. <laughs> oh <laughs> no. <sighs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> wow. Well. Yeah. Not in John Carpenter's vampires being buried alive. Very that memorable. Was, uh, yeah. That's sick. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah. Well, I mean, you struggled a little bit with uh, claustrophobia before there, from what you yes. told us. So. Yeah. And that one was, hey, you know, showed up on set. There were like eight, you know, plots dug in the ground. They're like, go find a hole and see if you fit in it. What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, here we are, these vampires. And we go and we lay down and they're like, okay, so that's going to be your, your little grave plot. And we're going to bury you alive. Sweet. And they did. Fantastic. They buried us alive from here down all the way in dirt. And we had this thing. We had, we had um, some cardboard boxes with these little flaps that came right over our face to keep the, the dirt off of our face and buried in dirt from here down. Whoa. Nope. <laughs> yeah. that's what i said and i was like um i don't know about this and they're like yeah we're gonna do it again that four, times. four times we ended up doing that wow. four times and i was like oh we but wow. when you see it in the movie it is the coolest scene it like it's it's literally the coolest scene i've watched myself participate in in everything like you don't nice. know that there are eight people buried in the dirt until you see us start coming out of it. And it's just like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> it's like wow. they were literally buried cool. alive. Yeah. Wow. All right. And final question. You're walking along a sandy beach in Australia and you stub your toe on a genie's lamp. So you pull it out. And before you know it, there's a giant genie standing in front of you and he grants you three wishes. What are they? <laughs> First wish, a thousand more wishes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that, is that fair? <laughs> I guess nice so. one. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. A thousand more wishes. Um, let's see. Second one would be anyone who's in pain like depressed anxiety all of that that it would go away because hey, those two yeah. states of being nice. are just ugh, awful yeah. um let's see and what else <laughs> my next wish would be how about less government control and more people <laughs> control <laughs> <laughs> yeah very nice less government very good. more humanity <laughs> if there's other thousand wishes of, you know then i'll get to the other stuff after <laughs> oh we'll yeah do that. we'll do that next time the we'll yeah. rattle the thousand off next time exactly <laughs> just a whole episode based on that yeah that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> well Marjane, this has been so much fun uh thank you incredibly much for joining us today uh, before we go do you uh do you have any current or future projects you'd like to promote at this time. I know you mentioned there's the Derek McBee film and that other yep. one. Is there anything else that comes to mind? So the Satan's Atlantis, Darren's project, Atlantis. instruments of justice. Yeah. If anyone wants to find me on um, Facebook, they can do so on Margin Holden fans and Instagram is very tricky at Margin Holden. <laughs> and <laughs> don't forget, <laughs> don't forget at Margin Holden. <laughs> <laughs> you know and then my website margineholden.com you can always find out where i'm at what i'm doing you know i'm pretty slack on trying to keep up with that too but you know just find me on instagram it's a lot easier <laughs> yeah all right so fantastic yeah yeah 
Sweet. Well, thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, guys. And there we have it. It's been a great time chatting with Marjean today. If there's anybody from the Annihilation film that you would like to see on the show, feel free to let us know in the comments, and we will continue to try our best. We appreciate all the continued support, and we will see you in the next one. Until then, you know how it goes. Have fun, stay safe, and stay flawless.